Hello, everyone. For those of you just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session is No Normal and features Shumi Bose and Keller Easterling. Hi, Keller. Good to see you. Good to see you, Shumi. Um, perhaps we should start by just kind of situating a little bit who and where we are, and then maybe explain what we were trying to talk about through No Normal. So, well, I'm in London right now in my flat where I've been for about four months. Um, it's 10 p.m. Um, but more generally, uh, I teach what we call contextual studies, so critical and historical studies of architecture. Um, and I also get to curate exhibitions about the same. And I know your work through my work, so you go ahead. <laughs> the same. Um, I'm, I'm an architect and a writer who work on architecture and, uh, and global politics. Um, so I've written books like Extra State Craft um, or a book like Subtraction, which is looking at um, not only putting the development machine into forward, but putting it into reverse. And um, a forthcoming book coming out in the fall with Verso is a, a book called Medium Design. That might be something we can, that might give us some material mm -hmm. here to talk about at this, at this juncture. Um, I know we decided we would talk about this co COVID as a kind of X-ray of of racial injustice and inequality um, and kind of systemic malfunction. I think you know lately a lot of my thinking as a as it's yours has been about systems and not only where to intervene in them but um, how fallible they are sometimes in their impositions. Yes. Huh? So to have this. Um, have this very sped up rehearsal of for climate catastrophe is exposes a lot and puts a lot of things on a on the playing field. Um, I mean, we wrote in our little blurb that it um, that we were trying to expo trying to use this COVID nineteen or what some people are calling COVID sixteen nineteen, which means. Um, more in the U.S., um, but it's kind of exposing a modern mind, uh, the modern Enlightenment mind, still at work, uh, um, still uh, trying to find a way to replace God with some other cobbled together whole of some sort, um, trying to keep together the myth of solutions and right. Something we deal with a lot in uh, architectural thinking and the planning of space. There's, there's this succession of solutionistic thinking there of like, this is the way. And actually the system through which you were looking before was wrong. And what you need to do now is use this system. And so, I've, yeah, I've really been um, enjoying the, the parts that you've shared of your forthcoming book um, about, you know, the need to find these sort of... Um, particle kind of modules or lenses through which the whole sort of thing falls into line, falls into a sort of organized system. And, and my inherent suspicion of that, probably through teaching architectural history and realizing that it never works, the parameters of the system are constantly changing and therefore systems don't hold. So yeah, I mean, those are things that, as you say, the current COVID crisis has been kind of as you put it, it's kind of exposing not how effective and efficient and productive isolated ways of thinking, siloed ways of thinking are, but rather productive entanglements, I think, is the, the phrase that we've been throwing around. Uh, and the need not to find necessarily systemic solutions or modernist solutions, but ways of redesigning or rethinking those entanglements isn't you know a perfect or necessarily radical idea but then the word radical is something we've been debating as well no yeah that that's the, well, there are all these very stubborn habits of this modern mind um as you mentioned looking for newness the 
the, the new thing that must kill the incumbent thing. Um, freedom, universals, elementary particles. Um, um, and it's, it really is as if culture strains itself to maintain this, this myth um, that, you know, that also that different parts of a problem should be strained out into their thin uh, specialties of knowledge from econometrics to, um, to informatics. Uh, and, and then each bit of the problem solved in turn. Um, and it's a, tra it's a tragic sort of habit in the sense that, that the thinness of that information and the segregation of it erases uh, all the very information that you're trying to work with. Um, well, I think it erases different ways of acknowledging value or quality or operation, so to speak. And, and even using these words, as I would say fairly technocratic words, um, they're sort of colored with a, a means towards productivity and they're still, they still feel like they're colored with a sort of econometric lens. And I think perhaps, I mean, I've been questioning why we keep using the term modern or modernist and what it is that that sort of, uh, really means if I'm if I'm saying I'm critiquing a modern mentality that's imposing systems I mean modernist with a capital M would be an architectural movement which you know reflects and riffs off of industrialization so we're talking about again mechanical systems and technocratic ways of thinking as liberation um but I think there's, as you say, a much longer tradition of looking for systems to organize, perhaps to replace a kind of primordial or heavenly system or religious system. And yeah, I mean, it just seems like if we can see the fragility or fallibility of those systems in certain situations, it seems odd that we don't depend on them to quantify and basically delineate the systems of exchange that we have down to one single, as you were saying, the market yeah. system. Yeah, it's it's strangely it's strangely irresistible kind of ideational you know monotheism or the the the, the you know uh, tendency to to towards monoculture. Um, uh, you know, as you say, exactly the use of the word system um, and. Uh, the romance with the idea that you will have a singular platform um, that will be the, the, that will provide the elementary particle that will be the thing that with which you will parse everything that you will have the, you know, Turing complete uh, platform. And it's, 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 I don't know whether it's funny or sad, but um, the, it is tragic that um, uh, that then when reaching for something more sophisticated, one ends up with something strangely more primitive and, and crude. Um, in Maybe we should give some examples of, of what we've been talking about. I feel like I'm, because I'm talking to students a lot, maybe I'm kind of happy swimming around in abstracts, but sometimes they also need concrete images. So... I don't know, can you think of an existent, uh, uh, yeah, I guess maybe when we're talking about the econometric notions of uh, measuring value, I mean, lately I've been talking about, um, with my students, using some of your work about the sort of peripheries of cities and the sort of very questionable land uses and rights and agencies that are accorded to, um, well, different different stakeholders. Do you think that could be a way of talking about you know systems and um, what we're talking about modern impositions. Yeah, I, I mean, the, it's it's I think it's good to, to amass a bunch of these examples. Um, but it makes it makes it much clearer uh, if one's talking about entanglement then to get all the messy things onto the on Let's do it. lumpy messy things onto the table. Um, but you, you don't you, I mean, I think we've talked about this before, that there is that tendency to look for some kind of 
uh, economic magic bullet to, for all the right reasons, you know, to to create greater, to to kind of counter inequality. I mean, uh, and 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 uh, and. Um, various forms of, of structured violence uh, in in culture sure. um and of course one wants to work against those against those things but um to assume for instance that there is some kind of economic magic bullet that will solve that will solve it um and you do see that even now um best intentions um but and I and I don't mean to be critical of uh, I don't know there's other people who may be incredibly interested in blockchain as an as I am for instance but it's a good example of something that if it is seen as kind of the singular platform and not simply a tool to be used um, for for ledger making and so on it 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 can create its own dangers and. One of the things that I would be doing as somebody, and you too, as an architect, one of the things we're, I think, trying to do is demonstrate different kinds of embedded value in relationships and in spaces that are heavy. Um, so, and the mixtures of heavy and digital and epidemiological and econometric and on and on, the mixtures of all those information, all that information. Um, so here's a really simple example. Um, sure. Like in, uh, maybe it's easiest to start with kind of nothing where, where there is no money, um, even where there's a deficit. Um, and I love this example of um, social capital credits where in situations where there is no money, and there's only needs one starts making a mode of exchange from the needs themselves. Um, um, and it's, so it's not problems, but sort of the way one can arrange those problems, the way the problems are entangled, which, which uh, can even create a kind of currency of needs. So in these social capital credit examples, um, a group gets together to look at their needs and give them a kind of value. Somebody needs to take care of the kids. Somebody needs to mm -hmm. take care of older people. This river needs to be uh, cleaned up. Um, mm -hmm. And the beauty of this idea, it seemed to me, is that once you accomplish that task, you clean up, you get some little credit for that, but then that credit can only be exchanged for something else that the community needs. Like you can, you take care of an old person, you can exchange it for a vaccine or a book or something like that. Okay, so there's no sort of mechanism for accumulation of capital such as it is. Right. And yeah. it, I mean, it's just an interesting example to start with, wherever, wherever you think about it, you may find it's a limited example, but, but it's, it's it's interesting in that it it's talking about lumpy relationships as mm -hmm, having mm -hmm, mm -hmm. value, um, and a monet a monetization of those lumpy relationships is not really necessary or may only be um, secondary to a spatial relationship. I mean, it starts to get messy when you get outside of that system and when exchange needs to happen beyond that, right? And then you need to make these things somehow fungible or translatable outside whatever agreed upon system is. And I think it's the, that need for metrics that kind of drives us towards, you know, and, and it's the metrics that creep me out about any of these systems. Well, there's two things. I think the, the over-reliance on metrics and specifically kind of metrics, but also... I think the conflict between that and the rhetoric of liberalization and freedoms, and I think that's the stuff where that the, you know tips me from being interested in cryptocurrency to pathologically interested in cryptocurrency, because now I'm kind of looking at the difference between the structures that these activities are intended for or could be used for and the difference in the rhetoric which surrounds them. And somewhere along the line, um, 
there are problems. There are problems. Um, and, and again, it's not it's not that the not that a, a, a blockchain couldn't be used and used in multiple situations and used partially. It's when there's a dream of it being the whole and the universal, or mm. when one sees attached to it rhetoric about freedom and frontier and all those kind of mothballed modern. Um, uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's still very territorial or acquisitive or um, often land-based in a weird way <laughs> or military sometimes, but that's depending on which platform you're into. You choose your gods still, but there yeah. has to be one. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's attractive. It's, a, a, it, it's attractive because it also... Um, it provides a kind of attractive newness, an irresistible newness, you know, that, uh, um, yeah, I mean, it, it is, is in the end dispositionally maybe more primitive. Um, hmm. Well, um, just as something I don't often do as a, Something I don't often do as an academic is is take part in reading groups. But um, recently, I won't say I've had more time on my hands, um, not at all. But I did join one, and um, we were reading. I mentioned to you earlier we were reading um, a very short story um, called "The Cares of the Family Man" by Kafka. It's such so cheesy to be reading Kafka with a reading group, isn't it? But it's a one page story. The point is that none of us really had much time. And it's about, well, it involves... Oh, you know what it's about? Oh, good. I'm glad because I, I, I've never... It's, it's been a tough one, that one. Mm. Well, uh, I was relating to it on several levels, but I think maybe there's a way to relate it to this. And see, this is an example of what I think is a way of perhaps navigating lumpiness. It involves a lot of lateral um, leaps, so forgive me. But um, in uh, The Cares of the Family Man, there's a thing called Ardradec and without recounting the one page story one doesn't know what to do with it because it's it's impossible to appreciate whether it's first a living thing or a non-living thing a mechanical thing that is for another function or a finite thing in itself and there seems to be no system which accommodates this thing um no way of looking at it no way of knowing it or it's larger context and um it's a funny thing i was relating to it in a very strange and very particular way in that um i'm uh indian by origin but i was born here i was raised in india and then i came back here for high school and now i teach here and the current identity issues are ripping up a lot of my students in ways that they didn't rip me up for various reasons um, when I was their age. But I think it's also to do with the increasing number of systems by which we're supposed to order ourselves and outside of which we start to panic and not really know how to find our place. Yes. Um, and the inadequacies of this are resulting in a lot of um, not only operational problems in terms of like college semesters and learning accessibility and how do you do that when your students are distributed across everywhere, these sorts of, I would say, operational things, but also psychically really grief around um, the fact that one perhaps doesn't fit into the system one thought one did and, and so on. So I'm talking for too long, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, I guess a lot of the work that I find myself doing a lot is is in between these things, using history, using discussions of class, using discussions of all sorts of things to try and help people see that between the systems there are meshes of of thinking which which can be negotiated and which can be you know, which perhaps leaves rooms for possibility. And perhaps as we're coming up to 20 minutes, we should maybe think about spaces of possible action 
Right. Well, they, you know, they, and potentially just the relief from the modern mind it is the relief from the, from the violence of the modern mind. I mean, the, in the story, there is an indigestible spool and um, there's no, it's not going to be parsed by some grander um, the scheme of things. It's, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you see even here now, I can hear helicopters outside my window because we're, the changes here have been sufficient that we can take on questions of, um, that are rhetorically powerful, abolish police, defund police. Oh. It's also, it's making it possible for us to see that in cultures where um, the, the violence of the culture is not going to be measured in any one way, um, the many ways in which uh, a culture is being made violent, sometimes with an, an imminent violence around which there is no event. Um, and even being able now to see the way in which when there is that imminent violence in culture, uh, withdrawal of privilege and health and safety and the starving of health and welfare, uh, when the response is to add to that violence with violence, to try to deliver that violence with another mode of violence like policing. And then when that doesn't reduce the violence, try to, uh, um, add the violence of, of a, a distended um, prison system, um, you can see that it's the, the, the violent thing is the monoculture itself. And defund the police is a way of talking about all those different strands of, of culture, which would, which would be allowed to uh, be funded which would be allowed to be in interplay in a more complex interplay. So, you know, this medium design book is simply about that, is simply about, it's, it's saying, you know, designing is entangling, designing is the making of interplay between these things or the, the desegregation of, of these uh, components of culture that. Right. And in terms of space of action, it is, as you say, the disentanglement, the desegregation and my sphere of work, it is currently problematically, usually decolonization that I'm involved in. Um, I know not everybody's comfortable with that word. Um, but hmm. I think what was lurking as a sort of uh, question that I was thinking might come from my students I don't think we're talking about the absence of systems, I mean, or anarchy, right? I mean, no. we're talking about the abolishment of the police doesn't then result in, or rather, I don't think in our conversations we're advocating for anarchy. It's rather the opportunity of assessing entanglements. Do you think I'm putting that okay? Uh, the, it's, the, it's permitting those components of permitting and nourishing, allowing to flourish those components of, of culture, which are, are segregated or under the thumb of a kind of monoculture. Um, I mean, even when one looks at some of the work of, um, you know, economists like Duflo and Banerjee, who are, who are looking at, um, at poverty and looking at the randomized controls, trials and so on, and there's much more authority for their ideas and culture because they come with quantified uh, um, results. Yeah. But one could look at their work in another way, which is not that the quantified results have much authority, but just that the interplay between components, period, is what is often responsible for some of the success of those uh, trials. Um, and can we, I think we have time to share a little bit of what that's about. No, can we, um, again, just to allow people to picture a little bit of what's at stake in their theory. 
Right. So, for instance, um, if one believes that, if one uh, agrees that immunizations help to reduce poverty, but um, there's a difficulty in timing or walking to a clinic to get those immunizations, some of these randomized controls trial would, for instance, in the classic case that Duflo and Banerjee talk about is, you, know, you, you might get a bag, a two pound bag of lentils or something if you go, to, if you make the walk. So you'll go ahead and make the walk anyway. And then mm. with these proximities together mm. with the, you know, the distance of the clinic from the village, these are all spatial things. Um, the timing of the nurse who's there. Uh, so if there's more volume of people kind of making that gamble for the lentils, then the nurse yeah. has, ha, is her, nurse can, who's already being paid anyway, will have a, another kind of efficiency and she, she will reliably be there when you come to get the, um, yeah. so all these, it's just a simple interplay between components um, and I've got a couple of things that are popping up immediately just in terms of that example. I mean, on the one hand, it strikes me as, again, somewhat traditional, like going back to a slightly more subsistence, might I even say less modernized form of living where entanglements are allowed and things aren't um, atomized, the productive city and the zoned, you know, various uh, components of zoning. So that's one thing that strikes me about that and I might have forgotten the other um, I guess in thinking about how they mimic traditional um, more traditional um, spatial structures let's say towns which had commons and so on rather than modernist cities or mega cities um, it's funny how those very, those very characteristics are now so extremely privileged and hard to access, or they exist in those messy urban peripheries that, um, you know, I'm thinking of favelas or slums or areas where I think I, I mean, I feel like I, my interest in urbanism stemmed from working in, in slums in Bombay because of the, density of entanglements not the density of space i'm not advocating for slum conditions but the the resourceful um mesh of entanglements which allows survival in the most and resilience in the most challenging of situations right. or there are things where there are gated communities and everything is within a two minute walk so that there's you know a certain level of security it's uh, it's just funny how what was sort of learning is possibly um, a better form of life is what ext what occupies these two poles. I mean, you could invoke James C. Scott, someone like James C. Scott talking about the sort of failures of every high modern concept um, because of a lack of mitis, um, of, of, of know-how, of, of um, in interchanges between things that are um, and this always sounds contradictory, the, the editors always change it, but that are, that are things that are indeterminate to be practical, um, indeterminate in order to be practical. And this, you know, this drives people crazy. Like it, it, this is impossible for the modern mind. It, you know, indeterminacy, ideas of temperament. Um, you know. Well, exactly. So here's the, the thing. The, the reason why these things are, you know, discussed, let's say in the humanities and certainly in the arts as kind of quote unquote radical uh, methods of maybe, you know, even towards degrowth and things like that. They don't work in the metric world where things must have fungibility and must be measurable. I don't know. I mean, um, I'm just looking at the time here, but I'm thinking about um, that problem of fungibility, especially when you come out of the gated compound or out as a favela and then you then have to in interface with the rest of the world, which is predicated on the market system or, or at least a capitalist kind of system of exchange around money. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah, it's just systemic change at various degrees is, is very, very slow. And I feel like the complexity there are certain things that are easy to change. There are certain things that are easy to, um, you know, put into policy, perhaps, or to 
demonstrate solidarity with on Instagram or what have you. And, and those actions, I'm not saying they're meaningless. I think not at all. I think certainly in the time that we live in now, which I think you refer to in your book as, as like, you know, we need visuals and we need metrics and then those sorts of optics and actions that produce images and metrics are what convince a lot of us. But the sorts of systemic change that we're talking about don't often have, and in um, De Flo and Vanity's example, don't have measurable or definable um, outcomes. And this is where they fall down as systems to be adopted, I feel like. Well, let's, let's just take let's take a property in that, another kind of concrete example, like a property in that curve, like exploding now, exploding mm -hmm. the periphery. In, in the world that is exploding and de-densifying at the same time. Um, and sometimes these properties are called informal settlements. I don't, I don't like that word because it is formal. It's just not a form of uh, that, it, you know, that is- It's just categorization. Establishment yeah. of, of planning or something. Um, but those properties Many people think, oh, well, just to, to help the poor, you know, we, we will monetize those properties. Um, right. um, and um, you mean with like land deeds and uh, things yeah, like that? Soto or something like that. Yeah. Um, but I, I would I would say that the spatial reality of those properties in relation to each other, the spatial values, the values of proxemics. Um, proximities are equally important to the, the monetization. Um, and so, you know, for instance, there are, there are protocols in, in use that um, take properties, allow people to pool their land um, together, insert infrastructure into it and take back a smaller piece. Um, so they might at some point monetize it, they might get a loan, but that's secondary to their choice to make value through arrangement. They are pooling the land, agreeing to take okay. this back because the property that they're going to receive is one that will continue to increase in value. So it's not the, it's not the buyout for cash um, that doesn't increase in value that, that allows capital to be the only beneficiary. It's a way of making um, and keeping value in lumpy, heavy arrangements um, that have more tangible risks and rewards. I mean, it's interesting that that idea of is also interesting in terms of reparations here. We were thinking about that in the US now. Um, you know, the insult of trying to monetize an incalculable harm um, mm. uh, as a form of reparation. What would it be like to think uh, and you know learn from some of these other uh, experiments that are going on to talk about something like compounding reparations, where what you are working on are things that have compounding value because of things that you can control in your environment. And you mean rather exactly singularly? Piece too. Yeah, rather than singularly using money as the reparation. Yeah. Yeah. You might have a loan, but that's secondary to the, you know, to, and the same with defund the police, that yes, there might be money in there, but there's also other kinds of information and there's other kinds of specialists and mm, other kinds yeah. of counselors and, actors besides this one specialist that we call a police person. I mean, thinking back to property and the problematics of granting land deeds to, let's say, slum dwellers, for example, um, which then renders them vulnerable, vulnerable, which then renders them, renders them accessible to systems of not only capital exchange and, and, and that being the only sort of well, you, you have a chip to play with, don't you? Um, and therefore you have the possibility and the potential for risk, but also you're subject to tax and other forms of 
let's say systematization you might call it subjugation but you're, you're subject to a whole load of other um various neoliberal de devices once you're talking about property and ownership and this is one of the reasons why i think i remain cynical of certain projects um that have been celebrated for offering the possibility of ownership i mean in this country we had that with right to buy when social housing was turned over from a common good into something that could be allowed to accrue value on the free market it was disastrous and and responsible in my view for some of the housing stuff so because we have five minutes i'm going to ask a silly question do you uh, do you think um not in this context but i think you referenced pruton in your book forthcoming book you guys are going to have to wait um referenced what sorry pruton uh, who, who talks about, I mean, I mentioned anarchism earlier, and again, I don't think either of us would advocate for that right now. But um, he's, I think, often the quote, property is theft, is ascribed to Proudhon, and I wondered where you stand with that. Well, I think he's a character, I mean, he's a character that, who we were talking about, James C. Scott, before a character that James C. Scott is, is also in, uh, intrigued with because because of discussions of mutualism um but it, it I mean the kinds of things i think we're talking about again are not looking for purity at any level not not political purity either this is not oh well finally when we seize the means of production or something we will we will no longer have property or anything like that no no it's things are too urgent for that it's it remains a lumpy world. Yes, sometimes they're banking things, you know, but then there's other information too, you know, like I'm not, uh, not going to wait for that moment of purity. That's again, the modern, you know, that's the, the still the modern dream. So it's yeah. mixing um, uh, lots of different kinds of value yeah. that in my view make something robust. Um, yeah, I mean, again, just reflecting on my um, current kind of professional uh, dealings and how much I'm learning from the sort of COVID mess. Um, I've been, I mentioned systems thinking earlier, I've been looking at this text by Don Alameda's, which uh, I imagine some of our audience might be familiar with. It's from 1997. I hadn't really engaged with it at all before. And Meadows is writing from a perspective of climate change, where she's talking to climate change scientists and she's talking about points to intervene in a system. And um, so although that text was useful in terms of climate change and thinking about what can be done, where can agency be found, I'm definitely finding it useful to use that text in all kinds of intersectional discussions about race, primarily at the moment, but also identity, also um, accessibility, for want of a better word. Um, all sorts of ways in which a text from climate change that I hadn't engaged with was opening spaces in conversations and opening ways of looking at things. And again, within the text, I guess, this idea that there are optics and metrics, I guess, that live in an actionable, easily actionable um, end of the spectrum where ethics and values perhaps live in a messier, less metric end of a spectrum. And, and it's not either or, but it's both and interlinked. No? If you invoke we're, another architectural. We're following right now a, a, a messy, lumpy protocol that's working on things from the scale of microns to the scale of territories that you know and we all know what it is it's hand washing but it's also something to, at the at, you know at the scale of microns and it's masks and distances it comes down to space it's it's if the, the one of the best things that could come from this covid thing is just an ease with the idea of lumpy protocols um, that and perhaps I indeterminate think, solutions yeah, yeah. Right, as solutions. things in time, yeah. Just indeterminacy, forget solutions. Okay, well, I think... They shouldn't always work. <laughs> um, they, they, that's right. They should, perhaps um, this is one of the hardest things for 
markets to accept, isn't it? Failure and the idea that things shouldn't always work, the idea that things... I think one of the things that I also, in retrospect, I guess I can say, found disturbing about millennium and post-millennium rhetoric was this idea of smoothness, of friction-free, of seamlessness. And I like the seams and the ridges of things, and certainly not for erasing those things that cause friction. I have a feeling that quality of what I live for anyway is found in that friction stuff. So the idea of everything being seamless was sort of terrifying. And, and so, yeah, I think exposing the fact that actually things have seams and cracks and lumps and bumps is, and maybe it'll take a while for us to see it as a good thing to come out of this, but it is where we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um which is also at the end of our 20 minutes. So, <laughs> um, our 40 minutes rather. There's, there's, there's a question um, that, yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> there's a couple of questions coming in from the audience. I'm just gonna bring them to you. In an earlier session, I wasn't involved in earlier sessions, unfortunately, I was tending to students, but in an earlier session, um, Chris Roth, speaker, spoke about the year 2038, in which, I guess a fictional scenario, maybe, in yeah. which you play the president. Oh, yeah. Um. <laughs> All right, so let's play this party game. What would you do? <laughs> first move, first move. I know exactly what I would do. I oh. know exactly what I would do. I don't know why no one's asked me to be president of the United States. <laughs> 2038, Kelly, we've got a little way to go, but not that long. Yeah, I know I've been rehearsing a lot of things about, you know, how to have dinner with an assassin. And I, I think I know what to do. I think you really can't count with me but to be the president of the United States. I know what I would wear, you know, everything. I know how it would work. Audience, take note. So what would be some of the first things? Um, well, I think the president of the United States would not be like me. The president of the United States would, first of all, be very still. Um, a still person, like a lizard is still, you know, like a, like a <laughs> reptile is still. I think if you, if you, if you're going that, if you're going to go up against uh, some of the scary bullies and superbugs, you have to have a kind of, uh, you have to pr at least project the kind of lethality that um, I don't have. Uh, but so if I'm going to play the president, I have to put that on a little bit. But I, I can do it. I promise I can do it. Um, okay. um, Sounds like work, but okay. Yeah. Um, and what decisions might you make? Can I push you on that or? Uh, well, I think, you know, one of those things that's disarming to one's opponents is uh, uh appearing to relinquish power. Um, and uh, the United States was, you know, at, at least originally, supposed to have checks and balances, and the very kinds of entanglements we we're talking about. Um, uh, so I think it would be incredibly interesting to uh, not to in, not eliminate problems and concentrate power, but make those entanglements between um, the um, branches of government more powerful, but then also bring in more um, mm. governors, the mayors, um, to find ways to lead apart from legislation. This is what I would do as, as president. Mm. I think somehow I feel like that we have to wrap up, but I feel like there's, I mean, there's so much to talk about all your plans for government, but um, it's somehow there's a final question that kind of came in is are metrics the problem or are what's being measured the problem? And somehow like the way that you describe, um, let's say the thickening of entanglements or the making explicit of them might involve a recon reconsideration of well, I don't know how you separate metrics from what's being measured I mean I think they're sort of well, metrics aren't the problem it's just wanting to have multiple metrics um mm. measuring many things I mean, mm. one can imagine you can sort of project a little bit not too far into the future to imagine that you know would we would we watch 
or what we pay attention to, we're already doing this with COVID is a kind of weather report of many different kinds of metrics that we're looking at, you know, rates of infection versus um, uh, household income and access to hospitals. You know, it, this biological agent is, is demanding that we look at multiple metrics all at once and climate change does too. Um, I mean, we're used to like the weather report, but imagine kind of like the weather report times, you know, something. Um, I'm just thinking of one, the weather, the weather report plus accountability. Already, I can't really imagine how long of a broadcast that would be. I mean, goodness, but, um, but already that sort of making something. You know, it's no, almost nothing. Do we measure? We don't. We don't. Well, we don't put the measurements together. Um, All right. Well, um, I think hopefully with lots more conversation to kind of continue in the future, both among our audience but also between us. Thanks so much for your time, Helen. So what a pleasure talking to you. And to you. Take care. <laughs>